Hey y'all, Coach and Fight here. You guys, stay with me. Hello. And in today's class, we're going to be talking about the importance of charitable deeds. I like doing charitable deeds. Why? Uh, I guess one of my main reasons, and I'm going to say, is because, for one, we're commanded to do that. But for me, one of my main reasons for doing it is because it makes me feel good. It, it makes, makes me better. feel like I've helped someone else. All right, good. And, well, you know me. You know, I'm always interested in the commandments of the Bible. So, in this video, we're going to focus a little bit more on that commandment that we are to do charitable deeds. Okay. All right. So, we're going to be jumping in several verses, several in scriptures, um, looking at the importance of charitable deeds. Um, particularly how it's related to the third temple. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, actually, you know, it's a requirement to get into this third temple. And we're going to find out in this class that we may need to ramp up our charitable deeds schedule because it looks as though the completion of this third temple is at hand and we'll need these charitable uh, deeds in order to ensure that we have a place in that tower-shaped temple. Okay, so what do you mean by charitable deeds? What exactly is a charitable deed? Well, you know, that could be part of this discussion too, you know, as we think of ideas um, of things that we could be doing for charitable deeds. But the first thing that comes to mind is um, a part of my testimony that I can tell you guys right quick here at the beginning or I can save it toward the end. No, tell us now. Well, if you remember back in the year 2013, um, we, you and I, were kind of in a backslidden state as far as the scripture was concerned. We had stopped keeping the Sabbath day. Um, we were barely keeping the uh, feast days. And we weren't doing much as far as the commandments, not even knowing about the covenant or anything. We we're kind of living in an Egyptian, Babylonian kind of um, Samaritan kind of lifestyle. Yeah, I think I want to sum that up by saying we had money, y'all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, there was... Um, one day that I was on my way home from work, um, they had let us off work early uh, because there was a snowstorm that was coming our way. And as I was leaving work, um, it was a bright sunny day with nothing going on. But you remember I had an hour and a half drive to get home. Mm -hmm. And so along the way, it started snowing real bad. Yeah. I remember. And it got to the point where the snow was accumulating on the ground up there in Tennessee. And the thing about it, as I was driving along, I passed this one individual that was walking. Right. And I thought nothing about it. I did notice him as I rode past him doing about 55 miles per hour um, in this uh, snowstorm. But when we got to the point where traffic had stopped... It was these truckers who decided that they couldn't go up this certain hill, so they both stopped side by side in the middle of the road and blocked traffic. Well, as I was sitting there for about an hour or so, this same individual who I had passed walking now passed me. I remember you saying that. Mm -hmm. He walked right past me, and again, I noticed him as I was sitting there in this long line of traffic waiting to get past these truckers. Well, skip ahead a little bit after we got going again, um, I ended up approaching the guy walking again. Mm -hmm. And But that time I decided to ask him because it was nighttime and it was about six inches of snow on the ground. I decided to ask him if he needed a ride. And he said, sure, he needed a ride. Um, he was a Latino individual who had been arguing with his stepdad earlier that morning and had decided to leave his mom and his stepdad's house and walk back to his grandmother's house. Right, I remember. thing about it, his mom and stepdad lived in Spring City, Tennessee, and he was walking to Dalton, Georgia. Okay, I think that's quite 
a few miles. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This he had been walking for hours and hours um, when I met up with him, but um, he still had quite a long way to get to Dalton, Georgia. And if you remember the story, we actually picked him up, brought him back to our house. I brought him back to my house and allowed him to eat my dinner. Um, we, you put his clothes in the washing machine. We put his shoes above the vent so they would dry out. And that next morning, we gave him a ride all the way to Dalton, Georgia, to his grandmother's house. Yes. Yeah. Well, he was on the road walking. And you guys have to understand that Spring City is right around the area where you worked at. And Dalton, Georgia, I remember, is right around the area where our son had went to school. And those are like on the opposite ends of the county. So he, he, was, he had walked a long way. That's a very long way. Let me pull up a map here. That's an hour and 32 minute drive. And he was walking and nevertheless he was walking in snow. So not only was he tired, but he was cold probably hungry, probably didn't leave home with the right clothing on because it wasn't snowing. No, he didn't know when he left home it wasn't snowing. But turns out that that was actually a 25-hour walk that he was on. Wow. I ended up picking him up in Dayton, Tennessee, so he had already been walking about five hours. Wow. He said he had woke up that morning deciding to leave, and he had been walking all of that morning. Mm -hmm. And it was after work when I picked him up. Which, you know, I had been at work for about, you know, six, seven hours before they let us off. Right. We picked him, I picked him up in Dayton and he was going to Dalton. So he had about another 23 hours of walking. Wow. He definitely, if no one else had picked him up, he definitely wouldn't have made it. Yeah, because it was dark when I actually picked him up. And so we, I believe we ended up saving his life. But the thing about it. Like I said, at that point, at that moment, we were actually in a backslidden state. But if you remember, it was after that that we started to remember the Sabbath day. And we started to get back into the scripture. And things kind of started changing for us. And I believe, I believe that that's one of the main reasons why we're in the position that we're in now. It was like an opening. It yeah. opened the door for... Um, us to I don't know maybe like a wake up yeah mm -hmm. that, that allowed us to be you know woken up mm -hmm. yeah I agree you know and so that's what we're talking about in this class but we're talking about the importance of doing these kind of acts in general so but I bring this up because you said you know what are some of the things that are considered charitable deeds so one of them would be picking up people who or walking on the side of the road. Well, anytime you see anybody <laughs> in trouble, you know, it, it, they can not only be walking, um, you know, in a snowstorm or whatever, but it could also be the lady at the grocery store, you know, trying to handle her kids. She can't get her groceries in the car. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be holding the door for somebody. Right. Or, you know, it could be, you know, sharing some money with somebody who needs it or giving them a meal or something. There's a lot of things that we could do as far as charitable deeds. But the, hopefully by the end of this video, um, those listening will have the idea that they need to actually be getting out there doing it, whatever it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know, like, you used to tell our oldest son that um, to always, to remember to do charitable deeds. And he would say, well, I'm going out and, you know, giving sandwiches to the homeless and stuff. And those are some of the things that, you know, that's, those are other ideas. That yeah, whatever it is that the, the father puts in your hands to do. You know, if you have a certain skill or something like carpentry or plumbing or fixing cars or something like that, you know, you can be doing those things. You, you know, looking for opportunities to, you know, help out those that can't really afford mm -hmm. your, your skills or whatever you can actually consider doing them for free. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if the father has blessed you with money, you can consider, you know, uh, doing charity in that way. Right. Mm hmm. Cooking meals for people or even spending time with people, reading to kids, all kinds of stuff we can, we can you know, come up with. Yeah, I think one of the greatest charitable deeds that I know of is when people go down 
and read to the people in the nursing home. Yeah, spend time with those down in the nursing home, as a, as a, and the hospitals, yeah. and even prisons. And you know, you know, you, you get a lot of credit for doing that. But one of the main things that we can do real easy is actually praying for one another. Yeah, I was gonna say, you know, with the virus here today, you know, a lot of things were not accessible to as far as going into places. But one of the greatest deeds that we can do for others is to take the time and pray for them. Yeah, people in, you know, the news that may be sick or in trouble or even have perished already, we can pray for those individuals. We can pray for people in war torn countries and, you know, general prayers for people in the hospitals and prisons and stuff. Um, you know, that, that goes a long way as far as our charity is concerned too mm -hmm. but like we said the point of this video is to convince us convince those that are listening that you know we need to get on it okay you know the class that we produced yesterday on um, which was talking about the Shepherd of Hermits which we're going to see here those verses here actually convicted me as far as you know my efforts and charitable deeds and so I believe now it's time to ramp up the level of uh, work we're doing as far as charitable deeds because we're getting close to this uh, tower and the completion of this tower. All right. But anyway, let's go on. Um, now, before we get into this, you want, I want to remind everybody that this type of class is not really for everybody. Is not? No, because you have to remember that a lot of people who are professing Christians are what you would call Paulinian Christians. They are following the Paulinian doctrine, mm -hmm. which you remember Paul said he was uh, the designated teacher of the Gentiles. Right. And the thing about the Gentiles is they have no intention on surviving the tribulation. Yeah, that's true. Their plan is to actually go on before. and get before the tribulation ever gets started. They plan it on going away into the spirit world and not being here. Mm -hmm. But if you remember the scripture in the Bible, the promises of the Bible is inheritance of the earth. Yeah, that will be found in Matthew when the Messiah was giving the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, he talked about that in the Sermon on the Mount. What we see here, you got it in Psalms, talks about inheriting of the earth. And there's that verse that you talked about in Matthew. And, you know, if I did my search a little bit differently, we'll find... Um, uh, a lot of scriptures that talk about inheriting the earth, that is the main reason uh, for obedience to the law is uh, to have those instructions necessary to live through the tribulation. So what does doing charitable deeds and how does those two relate? Inheriting the earth and doing charitable deeds. All right, you're getting a little bit ahead of us okay. right now. But, you know, we were talking about, you know, the uh, majority of the professing Christians right. um, following the, the instructions of Paul. One of the things that Paul taught them was they didn't have to obey the rules of the Bible. Well, the, one of the reasons why he was telling them that was because they don't really have the option to inherit the earth. But we're going to see here that not only is it necessary to follow the laws of Moses, but to actually do charitable deeds for anybody who plans to be here after this tribulation. Those two things are necessary. Okay. All right. So let's go on in and let's set this up a little bit. Now, the first verses that I want to bring to your attention is over here in the book of Revelation in chapter 6. This is talking about the sixth seal. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been doing a lot of classes lately as the Father has been pressing on us um, to get a good understanding of these six seal events. Right. Yeah. And the, because it's actually six seal is what we're in right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we see here in chapter six that when it's talking about the six seal, it's talking about this great earthquake. It's talking about the sun becoming black as sackcloth of hair. It's talking about the moon becoming as blood. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing about it, all of those events are tied to the day of the Lord. Right. Right. So, I mean, it goes on to talk about um, the stars falling to the earth. 
and the heavens departing as a scroll while every mountain and island is moved out of its places. This is talking about the day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. We can see that connection when we look in books like Isaiah, Jeremiah, um, Ezekiel, especially over in Joel chapter 2, that what is talking about over there in Revelation chapter 6 is actually the day of the Lord. So let's come over to the third testament of the Bible so we can get a good understanding of what this day of the Lord is all about. We're looking here in chapter 55 of the third testament of the Bible. If you would, Stacey, read verse 29. But the hour of the conscience approaches. It is the same as if you would say that the day of the Lord or his judgment is about to take place. Then shame will rise in some and remorse in others. So what this is telling us is that the day of the Lord is the, is the same as the hour of the conscious. Yeah. Now, what does that mean to you? The hour of the conscious, uh, to me, means the time when we will start um, hearing that still small voice of the Father speaking to us. Um more loudly, I would say. Well, that should remind you of the new covenant that Jeremiah was talking about in chapter 31. Okay. When you're talking about your conscience actually becoming more loud, you're talking about that time in which all of humanity will start to hear our conscience again. And that's when we'll be under the new covenant. Mm -hmm. When we won't necessarily have to have the written law of the Lord. That law will actually be written on our hearts again. Yeah, that is when he's talking about the law is written on your heart, not so um, much as it being written on paper or in stone or whatever like that. Now, it should be easy to make the connection between this new covenant and the third temple. Do you see how they're related? No, um, you have to expound, it up, expound that for me. Well, when you come over to Second Peter, you start to hear about these lively stones. Yeah. If you will, go ahead and read First Peter chapter 2, verse 5. You also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So it's talking about us as being stones. Living stones, as you read in other translations, we are these living stones that built up the spiritual house. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of the book of Hermas. Why do you say that? Because um, it's talking about the living stones and my mind immediately goes to the tower. Yeah, the tower. And you, when you look at over here in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, it's helping us to make that connection between that tower that we hear about over there in the Shepherd of Hermas and these living stones that we hear about over there in 1 Peter. Mm -hmm. It is these living stones, which are our spirits, that are actually going for the construction of this spiritual temple that we know as the third temple. Okay. So to glance back over here at Revelation in chapter 6, what it's telling us is that during this sixth seal, we should see the building or the finishing of this third temple. Mm -hmm. I believe it started being constructed, as we saw in Revelation chapter 12, with the sign in the sky. And we're now looking for its imminent completion. Right. Mm hmm. But anyway, let's jump over to the Shepherd of Hermas because there's certain verses that I want to bring out in relationship to this temple construction and something that it says that we need to do before this temple is actually completed. I think I know where you're going with this, but um, I'm going to wait till the finish. Yeah, I'm going to see it through. Okay, so we're at the Shepherd of Hermas. Yep, we're actually in vision three of the Shepherd of Hermas. And if you would, read verse 98. Give freely to them that are in need, for some, by too free feeding, contract an infirmity in their flesh, and do injury to their bodies, while the flesh of others who have not food withers away 
because they want sufficient nourishment and the bodies are consumed. So here it is where we are talking about sharing with uh, one another. Mm -hmm. If I started you off in the previous verse 97, it talks about how we are to uh, share the creatures of God. Yeah. Like, for instance, how, you know, we hunt and how we raise animals. We even raise chickens or whatever. Um, we are, are instructed by that verse in order to share that protein with our friends and neighbors and especially those who are in need. Right. All right. If you would read verse 99. Wherefore, this intemperance is hurtful to you who have and do not contribute to them that won't. Prepare for the judgment that is about to come upon you. So this is talking about those of us who are not sharing, right? Mm -hmm. And talking about the judgment that is to come upon people who don't know or, or don't think they're supposed to share. Mm -hmm. It's saying how it is actually hurtful to to us. Yeah. It goes on to say that those, you know, people are actually getting a little fat and making themselves unhealthy while those who are in need of food, their bodies are withering away. Mhm. Mm yeah. Well, let's get down and let's look at verse 100. Ye that are the most eminent, search out them that are hungry while the tower is yet unfinished. For when the tower shall be finished, you shall be willing to do good and shall not find any place in it. So now here is the crux of this discussion here. Here's the main verse that we're talking about here because it's talking about this tower. Mm -hmm. We have made the connection that this tower that is talking about is the third temple. And we've shown that the completion of this third temple is actually imminent. Mm hmm. It can be in any day now. And so what it's telling us here is that those of us who have the ability to help others, we need to be actually trying to find those people that we can help before this tower is ever finished. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It says, search out them that are hungry whilst the tower is yet unfinished. So and this is why we wanted to do this class, because the tower is yet unfinished. And so this could very well be the most important thing that we should be doing right now is actually searching these people out. Yeah. One of the things that, you know, I'm seeing is that it's saying that do these things before the tower is finished, because after the tower is finished, you're going to want or I'm going to want to be doing these things and. It's just not going to be no place to do them. Yeah, because now the way I understand this, you know, and this I have to, you know, speculate a little bit here is because of that earthquake that we saw over in the uh, events of the day of the Lord. When you're reading in Isaiah and Joel and the other verses that talks about the day of the Lord, it speaks of it as a humbling period mm -hmm. and where all of the haughty people of the world will be humiliated. Mm -hmm. and, and you talk, okay, so how is a person humiliated by way of an earthquake? You're humiliated by the way of an earthquake is because... One day you have, and the next day you don't. Yeah, all your stuff has been shaken down to the ground. Right. You didn't just lost all of your 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 possessions. So who can you help? So there you are now looking for. Yeah, exactly. Who can you help? You didn't lost everything, and you realizing that you're in the day of the Lord, and you're realizing how important it is to do these charitable deeds, but yet you ain't got nothing. Right. All of the uh, canned goods that you've stored up are now broken and, and, uh, and in rubble. Mm -hmm. All of your uh, possessions that you used to have are gone. Mm -hmm. Your freezers full of food are now unthawing. Even your money. Even even your money is now become worthless. You right. know, the scripture talks about the gold and the silver and how people will cast it out into the streets because it is worthless. Mm -hmm. Of course, the dollar bill is going to be worthless being a fiat currency. So now that this tower is yet finished, you're going to be looking for somebody to help and you're not going to be able to help anybody. Yeah, the person that you want to help. Uh, is in the same position that you're in. Yeah, whereas you was haughty, whereas you had goods, whereas you was, what it say here, imminent. Um, yesterday, all of a sudden, now that this earthquake has taken place, now you sitting there in squalor with everybody else, you ain't got nothing. Mm -hmm. And you don't have 
and account full of charitable deeds that you have recently done in the past. Right. So that's why we're doing this class is because we have a little more time to go. We need to be filling up this account with charitable deeds. We need to be searching out those people who are hungry while well, the tower is yet unfinished. Well, a lot of people might say, I don't know nobody who's hungry or I don't know anybody that I can give to. Uh, what do they do? Search. <laughs> Search it out. Find somebody. Find somebody. Search it out. You know what I mean? Anybody who lives in a city, that's really easy. You know, they can go down to, you know, where the homeless people hang out, where the poor people hang out. You know what I'm saying? Shelters. Go mm -hmm. to any in any city. All you have to do to, is go to Martin Luther King Avenue and you're going to find a whole <laughs> lot of hungry people right. down there and just share with people. And then you're thinking about single moms, you know, mm -hmm. who can't always afford to give their children, you know, those um Specialty items that the children like, you know, go buy them some ice cream or something um, or, you know, give them, you know, some cookies or something or send a pizza over to their house every once in a while. We need to be searching out is what this is saying. Yeah. And if you a lot of you um, are like I was at one time, um, I would say, uh, well, they can have just as much as I have. Or one of my main things I would say is, uh, why should I give to them when uh, they're spending it foolish? You know, the person that I'm, the single mom that I'm giving to, you know, she's driving around in a nice car, wearing Gucci clothes. And did you see those shoes she had on? Um, but again, we're told that we're not supposed to worry about that, mm -hmm. about that, that we are just supposed to do as we're commanded and give. And the Father will hold them accountable if they are misappropriating the things that we're giving to them. Yeah, we can't think about that. All we need to be selfish in this when it when it comes to doing charitable deeds. You know, forget about that kid that's looking at you with his shoes on that cost more than your car. Right. <laughs> and just think about the fact that you have the opportunity to help him, even if it's just with a candy bar. Yeah, a lot of another some more good ideas is tutoring. Um, you know, uh, there, you'll find a lot of good ideas if you just think about it. And you know, a lot of times it doesn't involve you being, you know, one on one in contact with that person. Um, we just got to put our minds to it and actually want to do it. Yeah, but I, and I want to stress here how it's talking about the hungry here. Yeah. You yeah. know, we talked about all of these other charitable deeds and when the Lord puts them in our way, you know, it, of course, if we're riding along and we see somebody walking, some little old lady carrying her groceries on the road, of course, we will stop and say, ma'am, can I offer you a ride? You know, but the thing about it, as far as the hungry, we need to be searching those individuals out. And another place where you can find hungry people is at the end of the month. Yeah. Right before the food stamps come out, right before those welfare checks come out, there are a lot of hungry people in this world. Yeah, I remember you used to say that a lot of times. Um, uh, we used to have this uh, individual that would come and we would offer him a place at the table. But it seems like he usually just came around around the end of the month. That's when they all get hungry. <laughs> yeah, because the ends is not meeting. You know, don't 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 look for those people, you know, after those food stamps come out. After that welfare check come out, they're all going to be happy, high on the, on the hog, you know. They're going to be uh, have uh, cars full of gasoline, and they're going to be ripping and running. But, you know what I'm saying, wait about 15 days later. Wait about 20 days later, those cupboards are going to be empty, and they're not going to have anything. Mm -hmm. So, again, if a place to look for these hungry people is towards the end of the month, right before food stamp day. Okay, let me ask you this question. You know, before around 2010, well, 2012, 2013, some of the things that we were doing um, was we were giving to uh, different charitable organizations like uh, Feeding America, Feeding America, but we were America's also harvest. we were also giving to schools. Well, would those those wouldn't count, huh? Um, I, actually, I believe it does. You know, 
You know, I, uh, I believe anything we do um, as far as charitable deeds is a demonstration to our father that we are willing to be good stewards. And so when we have the day of the Lord, he sees us as a clearinghouse for his blessings. Hmm. If, you know, you don't find anywhere, you know, to give. I mean, I realize it could be hard for some some people, especially if you're living in affluent neighborhoods. You know, it may be a little bit harder. But if you're going out of your way, you know, to, you know, do charitable acts like, you know, we built a well over there in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, gave to the CFC, you know, every year we were. um even, you know, going as far as to buying those uh, sheep and goats and stuff that you can, you know, have delivered to those people in those third world nations. Sponsoring a child. Sponsoring yeah. children in Africa. I mean, we was doing a lot of stuff. But when the father sees that kind of activity and, you know, it is time for him to um, share with his people, he see you as a person that's going to do that. And so he may come in and ask some blessings to your life just so you can go out and share with other people. Right. Mm -hmm. I believe that wholeheartedly as well. Scripture teaches us that that as we give, he gives right back to us. And it's usually the thing that we give him. Let's go ahead and read verse one on one right quick. Beware, therefore, ye that glory in your riches, lest perhaps they groan who are in want, and their sign come up to God, and ye be shut out with your goods without the gate of the tower. So while this tower is still yet unfinished, and it may appear as though nobody around us is in need, you know, we really need to, like I said, start searching these people out or we're going to be shut out with our goods. Like we were talking about earlier, um, we're going to have our goods. They may be, you know, destroyed or, you know, or in shambles or whatever. But there we are sitting amongst all of this broken glass and decaying food while this tower is finished and we can't help anybody with it. Yeah, one of the things that uh, come to my mind when it talks about and their signs come up to God and you be shed out with your goods without the gates of the city. It reminds me of a lot of times when, you know, somebody say that they're in want. And the first thing that it seems like we do is we say, oh, I'll be praying for you. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have, why not just give it to them yeah. instead of praying, which is good. Mm -hmm. Why don't you just give them that? That you have, you yeah. know, if especially if you have extra. Yeah. The scripture talks about, you know, how we live now, not understanding these principles around giving. So people think that if they give something to somebody, that they're not going to actually receive anything in return for it. Mm -hmm. But that's actually not the case. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to see in some of these other scriptures here um, that when you actually give, the Father returns everything that you have given even more so than what it was that you gave. Right. You might give somebody your old raggedy coat. And then it turns out that, you know, you get a coat that's more, you know, better fitted for you mm -hmm. and your needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, now let's come over and let's look at the third testament of the Bible. Um, this is one of the places that we'll talk about in here when it's talking about charitable deeds. Um, let's look right here in chapter 63 of the third testament of the Bible at verse 187. You will perform charitable deeds during the course of your journey, for that is your mission. You have many spiritual gifts with which to be charitable in different ways. If you are able to prepare yourselves, you will perform that which you call impossible. So here it is. This is a commandment of the third testament to actually be charitable. It's telling us that this is our mission. Hmm. You know, and, you know, I didn't plan on going into this too much in um, this lesson, but we learned that that's one of the ways to trigger the Elijah spirit is through charitable deeds. Okay. Of course, you want to be, you know, obedient to the law. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you do charitable deeds, that actually brings that spiritual valley closer to where you are. And and like it says right here, you will perform that which is called impossible. 
Mm-hmm. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about this Adaja spirit or this covenant angel. He is actually going to be who it is that helps us to survive the tribulation and he's going to do so in an angelic manner. Well, it is these charitable deeds that provokes him to actually do this for right, us. Right, right, yeah. I believe that, yeah. But the point is, from this verse, it is it says that it is our mission. Mm-hmm. But now, look at verse 188. The charity that you render by means of a coin, although it is charity, is the least elevated that you can give. Now, there are certain people right now who has more money than they have time. They, right. You know, don't have skills that they could share with other people. Sure, they'll want to take any advantage that the Father puts in front of them to do mm -hmm. charitable deeds. Yeah. But, you know, if you know if all else fails, give. Yeah. I was thinking just yesterday as the Father was convicting me on this, how many people had actually donated to our ministry by way of Cash App. Yeah. And the thing about it, I don't use Cash App. Mm -hmm. So here you have all of these hundreds of dollars out there in cyberspace being unused. Yeah. Well, there's somebody out there who does use Cash App, and they may be in need of a sandwich or something that day, that day or a tank of gas to go get that sandwich. Mm -hmm. And so just that little bit that I could do to help them is considered charity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about when I when I read this verse, I always think about um, those people uh, who we would consider rich and famous and how they when they give charity, you know, we usually call it philanthropy or something like that. They give charity, but we know that they do not live according to the law, statutes and the commandments of the most high. But yet and still, just that giving, the Father seems to always bless them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So if he says that we have to do it, even if they're not, because we were in a backslidden state. Yeah. He still gives, his word is not void, he's still going to give them back what they gave. So it always just encourages you, even if you, you, you say, well... I'm not going to give or this is my last or whatever. Even if you do, don't have, give it and the Father is going to give it back to you. Yeah, like you said, even if it you know hurts you to actually give, you might you know be in jeopardy of going without that day by helping somebody else. Yeah, it's going to be a great benefit. That reminds you of the woman or the little widow and her might. Right. How she put her last penny into the... Um, into the offering plate. Mm -hmm. Well, that actually reminds me of another part of my testimony, if I can share that. Mm -hmm. Well, if you go all the way back to before I ever knew the Lord at all, before I had actually read my first scripture ever, we're talking about, about 1984 and 1985, when somebody asked me to go to church. Okay. I was actually in a bad position. You know, my family was in turmoil at the time, and I was pretty much as a homeless child. I was only really going to school because of breakfast and lunch. Mm -hmm. You know, other than that, you know what I'm saying? I, was, I, I really had no parents at the time who were, you know, help guiding me or anything. And that's only probably the only reason why I even finished high school at all was because that was the only place where I was getting food from at the time. Yeah. Well, there was a swarm person who invited me to go to church one day. They were having a event down there at the church. And I went down there. I sat down in the back of the, the uh, back of the room. I was in a far back pew there listening to what the preacher was talking about. And he gave a sermon on the widow and her mic. You was probably only there so you can get something to eat. <laughs> no, I was only there because the people had invited me there mm -hmm. and, you know, I didn't have anything else to do. I was living in an old abandoned house Driver's with no there. electricity, no heat, no television, no nothing. You know, so going to church was kind of a form of entertainment. Mm 
<laughs> yeah, at least I'm going somewhere. It's better than sitting around here looking at these dead walls every day. And so I went in there and I sat down. But like he said, he was talking about the widow and her mic and how this widow put everything she had into the collection plate and she got a blessing behind it. Well, I had 35 cent in my pocket that was actually going to be for my dinner that night. You remember? Hmm? I remember you said you would buy cookies. Or the something little Debbie like that. cakes from the convenience store. They were about a quarter at the time, uh, 35 cent. And I, that's what I had. That's what I would eat. I would get the most highest calorie little Debbie cake that I could get because that would have to, you know, be my dinner for tonight. And I had 35 cent that I was planning on, you know, walking. I had to walk like uh, a mile to the store to get that little Debbie cake. And but I decided to put that 35 cent in the collection plate that day. Hmm. And the next day, while I was in school, the father put it on my heart to actually ask my uncle for help. And by the next evening, I was eating steak. All right now. Yeah, I'm serious. He actually led me <laughs> to my uncle and my aunt's house who took me in. They heard my story and what I was going through, and they actually brought me in. And th that was a big family with a big food stamp card. <laughs> and, you know, I went from eating, you know, little Debbie cakes every night to, you know, that lady cooked good. <laughs> you know, and, he, and, you know, I attributed that to actually following, you know, what I perceived as instructions to put, you know, my last into that collection plate. I had no idea where I was going to eat from after that. Right. I had no, I, I didn't know how this all worked. You know, that was probably my first time ever listening to a sermon in all of my life. That's an amazing story. And it's, you know, and it encourages, encourages me and hopefully the people who are listening that doing what the father tells you to do, even if you're walking on blind faith that you definitely will reap the things that you sow. Yeah, that lady ended up leading me to Christ. She actually wow. got me baptized. Um, and, it, you know, she is um, a big part of who I am today because, you know, she went on praying for me and, and you know, she pretty much took me in at that point as a child. And I ended up living with her throughout the rest of my high school days there and you know so like I said I contributed that all to you know putting that little 35 cent in that collection plate yeah just that one little act of obedience and giving uh, changed your entire life around. yeah 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 yep. all right so now let's jump over to Proverbs chapter 19 I want to show you a few verses that talk about charitable deeds um, if you would read read there he that hath pity upon the poor leneth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. So, like you said, don't worry about your little last 35 cent. That could be the best thing you could do with that 35 cent. Where would I be today if I'd have kept that money in my pocket and said, you know what, I'm going across the street and get my little Debbie cake. Where would I be at? I don't know, probably somewhere sitting at an abandoned house as a 50-year-old. Yeah, ain't no telling. <laughs> <laughs> well, ain't no telling, you know what I mean? It, 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 very well could be, or in a prison somewhere, because right. the Lord never put me in a position right. where I could find out who he was. I could have never gotten baptized during that time, mm -hmm. and you never know where I would have ended up. Right. Mm -hmm. Best 35 cent I ever spent. <laughs> All right, read the next one. Proverbs 22 and 9 says, He that has a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Yeah, so... The blessings come for he that is bountiful. So, you know, the thing about it, you know, we live in a very selfish world right now. Mm. You know, people think that they aren't supposed to share with one another. But, you know, how many of these people are really being blessed? Yeah. You know, yeah. it is those who are actually sharing with one another that are actually being blessed during this time. Well, I could say, you know, I still have a little short testimony for myself about how um, Eva, this was just maybe a couple of years ago or a year or so ago, how I did not necessarily want to share. You know, mm -hmm. I was kind of stingy and I didn't want to. We only had, in my mind, just a little for ourselves. And I did not want to share with anybody else because, you know, I had myself and I had my children to take care of. That's mm -hmm. how I was thinking. But 
we will always have this cousin of mine who was always coming around and he was obviously looking for food yeah and i didn't want to give it to him you know i would take on a bad demeanor <laughs> my countenance wasn't good and he along with everyone in the household probably knew that i didn't want to share what we had you know, you were constantly getting on me about it. Stop acting like this. Why are you doing this or whatever? And I was like, well, we only have just enough for ourselves. You know, he has food stamps. He, he gets a check and all that kind of stuff. But you always, and I'm going to say made me do it. You know, made, he, all, we always had a uh, plate set for him at the table. And little by little, I started to see the blessing of helping him. Mm -hmm. Not only was our family being provided for in ways that, you know, how did, how did we get this or where did this come from? Ways that the Father was providing for us. But my mind started changing and I think he has a, probably a good eye on us about it, about how we, how we helped him. You know, we I think we 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 gained because we were able to you were able to minister to him a lot during that period. And I believe that he's in a better position just because even though I was reluctant and even though I just didn't want to do it, um, the father, I believe, blessed him and not only him, but blessed us through that. All right. Well, you know, let's look down at one more verse out of uh, Proverbs. Proverbs 28 and 27. He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. So you think, where would you be at today if you actually hadn't shared with this individual? Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. you could actually be have cursed yourself. Yeah, yeah. If it wasn't for you, I would have cursed myself because, like I said, you had the foreknowledge, the, the whatever, to, you know, say that, this is what happens. This is what is going to happen in this house. <laughs> You're going to give, regardless if you want to or not. Yeah, so, because okay. this is what the scripture says, you know. And, you know, it, it tells us the importance of charity all the way through. But like we said, in this video, we're actually realizing that, you know, this time that we're living in now actually could be the most important time when it comes to um, sharing and helping people because of this tower. We actually want to be in this tower, and if you want to get in this tower, you're going to have to be charitable during this time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, let's jump over here to uh, chapter 55 of the Third Testament of the Bible. And let's read out of here. Let's read verse 17. But if I come to prevent the people instructed by me and humanity in general, to whom I have made myself known in this time, listen, my children, here is the ark. Enter, I invite you. So now here it is, it's talking about the ark. Without going into all of the discussion about this, it's, it's making it clear the relationship between that ark that Noah had to float across the flood waters and the spiritual ark that we have now that we will use to float across the tribulation waters. Mm. Yeah, and you see right there where he says he, 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 he says he comes to protect the people instructed by him and humanity in general. So it's going to talk about these two kind of people right here, and it's going to give certain instructions for them. Mm -hmm. One is the people who are instructed by him. Those are the people who keep the law. Mm -hmm. And then it's humanity in general. That's like we were talking about earlier, those billions of people who follow the Paulinian doctrine. Right. Well, he's going to tell us what it is that we have to do in order to get in this ark so that we can survive this tribulation. All right, look at verse 18. For you, O Israel, the ark is the practice of my law. And all who fulfill my commandments in the most perilous and bitter days will find themselves within the ark, strong and feeling protected by the mantle of my love. Now, here it is, it's talking about the people who are actually keeping the commandments, mm -hmm. right? And it's telling us that it is necessary in order to keep the commandments. Right. Now, before we go on to the next verse, which was verse 19, I want to jump down to verse 21 right quick because it is talking about those people who haven't learned to keep the law as of yet. 
Nonetheless, at the hour of justice, I have never presented myself to ask if you have yet repented, or if you have prepared yourself, or whether you remain still submerged in disobedience and evil. So what this is talking about, like I said, is people who haven't learned to keep the commandments yet. He's talking about how we're in this so-called grace period, and it seems as though nobody's being held accountable for our disobedience. Right. Read verse 22. My justice has arrived at the appointed time, and he who has known to build his ark on time has been saved. Okay, so it's talking about this ark, and, you know, like in the days of Noah, it wasn't so much that the people had to have an ark proceeding the flood. In other words, nobody got in trouble for not having an ark. Right. It was only when the flood waters got up above their neck did they find themselves being judged mm -hmm. because they didn't have an ark. Right. Mm -hmm. And their judgment was their drowning. Mm -hmm. All right. Read, read, read on. And while he who responded with ridicule and did nothing for his salvation, when the hour of justice was announced, had to perish. So this is telling us the importance of having this ark right now and during this period that we're entering, which is the tribulation. Mm -hmm. But now let's come back up here and now let's look at verses 18 and 19 more closely. It's saying there in verse 18 that the ark for Israel is keeping the commandments. Mm -hmm. And it said, but notice how it said, and all who fulfill my commandments in the most perilous and bitter days will find themselves within the ark. So if we put this together with verse 21, it's saying that just like it was in the days of Noah, it ain't so important to be keeping the commandments before the flood waters come. But after those flood waters get here, the importance is that you start keeping the law then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see that? It's like keeping them during that time. During, like you said, during the most perilous and bitter days. So that's why you want to go in and you want to read over the book of the covenant, which is Exodus chapter 20 through 23. You know, even if you don't plan it on keeping the feast days and the statutes and the judgments and the commandments, you at least want to know what they are so that when you do see those floodwaters approach around your neck, you can start to obey those and start to keep those commandments during the most perilous and bitter days because it is, it is obedience to those commandments that's actually going to help you survive that tribulation. So is this the reason, this one of the reasons that you're telling us to start doing the charitable deeds now? So when the time approaches or while because the tribulation is so fast upon us, having those good works or having practice doing those good works is what's going to to help us. Well, naturally, read right there in verse 19. And to all this humanity, I say again, the ark is my law of love. All who practice love and charity with their fellow man and with themselves will be saved. Okay. So that's why I'm telling you to do it now. Okay. Right. That's why I'm saying that it's the most important thing that we could be doing. Right. Because, you know. A lot of times I think about the statistics and how there are thousands of people who are actually obedient to the covenant, whereas there are billions of people who consider themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. Well, the thousands of people, of course, they will be keeping these laws during the most perilous and bitter days. But the rest of the people need to be doing these charitable deeds right here so that they, too, can survive this tribulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because of what it's saying there, it's saying that all who practice love and charity with their fellow man and with themselves will be saved. And with themselves is talking about your family. Mm -hmm. So all who are doing charity during that time will be saved. And we could get into the scripture how it talks about being in the ark versus on the ark. Yeah. Just to give you a quick breakdown of what that's talking about. It's those who are keeping the commandments who will be in the ark. Those who are doing charitable deeds will actually be those that will be on the ark. Mm 
they may feel a little bit more of the elements. They'll they'll actually get hit by the rain showers, but at least they won't be underwater or whatever. Mm -hmm. They will actually survive the tribulation too. Yeah, yeah. And we could jump back over to First Peter and chapter four and see why that is. If you would read verse eight. And above all things, having reverent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitudes of sins. So there is, there it is. Mm -hmm. Charity covers sins. Mm -hmm. Doing charitable deeds makes up for the wrongs that you have done. <laughs> even though you may be breaking the commandments and breaking the laws, even though you've missed every feast day for your entire life, actually doing <laughs> charity for your brother covers a multitude of those sins that's what actually gives you the opportunity to survive the tribulation. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So do you see why now we need to start doing charitable deeds? Mm -hmm. Start searching out those people that are hungry? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm really into preparing uh, self-sustainability. Mm -hmm. So ch have, doing charitable deeds is like putting... Uh, Food in the mason jars. That's definitely like, well, <laughs> even better than putting, you, you got people who are storing up food in mason jars right now. Right. Instead of storing up their food in the mason jars, they might need to be walking down the street and trying to find some old widow lady or some old widower that is needing in need of this food. Some yeah. little child or somebody and give it to them mm -hmm. so that when this earthquake hits, they ain't got to worry about all of their broken mason jars that's going to be scattered all over the place mm -hmm. they will actually have angelic help that's going to help them survive this tribulation maybe even providing them with additional blessings to the point where they can actually share with others yeah so it's like instead of hoarding all of the toilet paper for yourselves you know you will have an angel angelic help that will come and and that toilet paper won't necessarily get wet or yeah. whatever. You have, have, yeah. yeah, you have the angelic help to come and, you know, I guess replenish your replenish needs. Replenish your needs, paper. yeah. Or even put it in your mind to, if you go out and help somebody to do something, he might put it in your mind to say, well, I'm going to take this toilet paper and I'm going to put it over here. And you'd be like, well, why am I putting it there? That's a stupid place to put it. But you you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you he'll never, help yeah. you protect it knowing yeah. what's coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good example. There mm -hmm. are some people out there now who are hoarding toilet paper, but then during this day of the Lord, their toilet paper is going to be get wet and soggy. Mm -hmm. While it's somebody else who took their last toilet paper roll and gave it to somebody in need but then at the day of the Lord they're actually going to be provided with enough toilet paper not only for themselves but maybe even for the rest of the half of the community yeah yeah and it works with everything you know everything everything from food to clothing uh, whatever to it shoes. is you have yeah mm -hmm. if it's time you know yeah, from time mm -hmm. if it's you know whatever it is that you can do to help somebody Now's the time to demonstrate to our Father that you will be a good steward of what He has provided you with so that when those tribulous days come, you will be somebody who can be used by these angels to help those in need. Right. Right. Well, all right. Well, that's all I got. You got anything else? I think the last thing I would want to say is to address it to parents and mothers specifically. As a lot of times we are put in the position, you know, I was raised to um, to keep whatever I have for myself. If it's mine, keep it because you don't know when you're going to need it and let them go out and get their own. That's how I was raised. So that thinking, you know, I bought it on into my marriage and thank the father that my husband is very charitable. You know, he probably was the kid who was giving away all his stuff. And I was the kid who was like, mm -mm, let them get them they, they get their own stuff. But I would say to the parents, stop encouraging our children to, you know, keep what I have for myself. You know, that's mm -hmm. that that saying that we have, God bless those who have who have their own. You know, that's not really that's not in the scripture. Yeah. It's just something that we made up. So let's give if we have a lot of clothes if we have a worn the, 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 the five coats that we have in our closet, 
in the past year, there's a good chance that we're probably not going to wear them. So give those stuff away. There's a lot of people who we think that have, and they're just, you know, they're just fronting. A lot of times they don't have, you know, they don't have food in their pantries or whatever. Let's give and and just be just be encouraged to give. And if there's anything I could do for you guys, just let me know. You can send me an email to endthefight at yahoo.com. I may not be able to help you pay your rent or your mortgage or your car payment or anything like that. But if you need food for the day, I could definitely help you. So let me know. And shalom. Shalom.